I stood leaning against the viewport of the USS Beyond Horizon, and below me, I saw the planet of the humans, a planet that unbelievably spun. For someone born in a tidally locked world, where one side eternally faced the sun and the other remained cloaked in perpetual darkness, the very concept of this rotation was baffling. It wasn't merely the physics of it that unsettled me, it was the humans themselves that intrigued me. How could they accept such instability in their lives? Trying to understand their existence, I began comparing myself to them. My pale leathery skin, which evolved to protect me from the freezing winds of the dark half of my home, seemed so specialized, while theirs appeared less adapted to extremes. Their soft, smooth skin lacked the resilience of my own, which had to endure the cold winds of the narrow mountain pockets where my species lived, close to the border of light and darkness. My elongated, flexible limbs, perfectly shaped for navigating the jagged, narrow spaces of the mountains in my world, felt clumsy and oversized in the human-sized quarters, designed for more compact and balanced beings. A thin yet resilient membrane shielded my eyes from the harsh glare reflected off the blazing side of my planet, while their unshielded eyes seemed vulnerable to the constant light changes that never troubled them. My nose, flat and close to my face, was designed more for filtering the thin, icy air of my world's shadowed regions than for sensing scent, unlike that of the humans which could seemingly absorb the richness of their spinning planet's atmosphere. Though my scientific mind grasped the potential benefits of a world where temperatures were more evenly distributed, the reality of this planet's rotation still disturbed me. Motion. Constant. Unrelenting. How could they tolerate it? How could they live in a world where the sky was never the same from one moment to the next? They adapted to their chaotic environment, while my kind had evolved to fit the unchanging balance of light and dark, frozen in place for eons. Their flexibility both fascinated and unsettled me. The humans, ever considerate of our different needs, had granted me and the rest of the non-human passengers a full day orbiting their planet on a geostationary course. We remained fixed in the sky above one spot while their world spun beneath us like a spinning toy. They claimed it was an experience we must have, a chance to witness the marvel of their dynamic existence from above. But I suspected a different motive. The growing disquiet among some of my fellow guests, rumblings of disbelief, doubts about how life could thrive on such a volatile planet, had perhaps prompted this demonstration. For those of us from tidally locked worlds, where one face forever gazed at the sun, while the other languished in eternal night, the very idea of a spinning globe felt like an affront to reason. How could a world survive such chaos? How could a species flourish without the safety of a stable, unchanging environment? The alternating cycles of light and dark, the drastic swings in temperature, the unrelenting movement of the skies, how could anything endure it? Even as I stood there, watching, I found myself struggling to comprehend it. The flow of my thoughts was interrupted by the soft hiss of the door, and a human I hadn't seen before entered the viewing deck. He didn't approach me at first, instead stopping before Azalcoran, a small creature with four tiny limbs and leathery scaled skin. Like me, they hailed from a tidally locked world, though theirs was a moon orbiting what humans called a hot Jupiter, a gas giant planet close to their star. I observed the human, curious about his intentions. He held a strange object in his hands, something flat with a reflective surface and a small, narrow rod. I had seen these objects before, but never understood why they still used them. I knew for a fact that humans had access to more advanced technology for storing and sharing information, Yet here this one was, pressing the rod to the object, making marks as though documenting something by hand. It seemed primitive, almost ritualistic. The human and the Zalcorin exchanged words, though I paid little attention to their conversation. What caught my eye was the human's repeated fidgeting with an earpiece that kept slipping from his ear, which he would tap back into place every few moments. The Zalcorin, the epitome of patience, 
waited while the human scribbled on his clipboard. Eventually, the human waved the Zalcoran away and turned toward me. You're from Dureshi, right? He asked, looking directly at me. I heard the translation of his words in real time through my implant. I raised an eyebrow ridge. I'm certain your species has already been provided with a list of all Federation species, their home planets, their ambassadors, and their origins, I replied, trying to keep the irritation out of my voice. Why do you need to ask again? The human scratched his head, an apologetic expression crossing his face as he glanced down at his clipboard. I apologize. My name is Daniel, and I'm new to this assignment. Still trying to match names with faces or, well, descriptions. Could I get your name? I hesitated a moment before responding. I am called Liren. Thank you, Liren, Daniel said, making a note on his clipboard. He fidgeted with his earpiece again. I'm just trying to make sure our records are accurate. I narrowed my eyes, staring at him with amusement and mild exasperation. I see you're still relying on primitive methods to track basic information. Daniel chuckled awkwardly, adjusting the earpiece as it slipped once more. Yeah, I know. We have better tech for this, but sometimes it helps to have something in front of me. Makes it feel more real, you know? I observed Daniel for a moment, considering his words. Perhaps this was an opportunity to understand more about these peculiar beings and their spinning world. My curiosity overcame my hesitation. Daniel, I began cautiously, may I ask how your people cope with the inconveniences caused by your planet's rotation? He looked at me, a puzzled expression crossing his face. Inconveniences? I'm not sure I follow. What do you mean by that? I tilted my head slightly, surprised by his lack of awareness. Well, the constant change between light and dark must disrupt your cycles. The temperature fluctuations, the shifting weather patterns, the instability of not having a more fixed sky. It all seems quite chaotic. How do you maintain any sense of consistency or predictability in such an environment? Daniel's eyes widened slightly, and then a smile spread across his face. Ah, I see what you mean now. Actually, we find comfort in the cycles. Rotation gives us day and night, which help regulate our biological rhythms. The temperature changes are generally mild compared to extreme worlds, and our weather patterns, while less unpredictable, provide variety that we've adapted to appreciate. I think you'll find Earth's environment quite pleasant, at least less extreme than what you're used to. I considered his words, pondering the possibility of finding comfort in change. Maybe there was more to this spinning world than I had imagined. Perhaps you are right, I admitted. I look forward to experiencing Earth firsthand. Daniel nodded enthusiastically. I think you'll enjoy it. Earth has much to offer, and we're eager to share it with you. As the shuttle began its descent toward the planet's surface, I felt a subtle shift in gravity. A reminder that we were leaving the controlled environment of the USS Beyond Horizon. Through the viewport, I watched as Earth's diverse landscapes unfolded beneath us. Vast fields of green were filled with winding rivers and clustered settlements. The ship landed smoothly on a sprawling meadow, the noise of its engines fading as the ramp extended to the ground. The hatch opened with a gentle hiss, and the other species' delegates started to disembark. The Zalcorans moved cautiously on their tiny legs, their scaled skin glistening under the unfamiliar sunlight. A group of Thalaxians, with their hard shells and multiple eyes, chattered excitedly as they stepped onto the lush grass. Their reactions ranged from awe to shy curiosity, each taking in the new environment in their own way. I watched them for a moment, noting the duality of hesitation and wonder in their body language. It was a rare sight to see so many species from tidally locked worlds experiencing something so fundamentally different from their own planets. The open sky, the gentle breeze, the vibrant colors. It was all a stark contrast to the narrow bands of habitable zones we were accustomed to. Taking a deep breath, I made my way toward the exit. As I stepped onto the ramp, the sun's rays touched my skin a sensation so alien that it instinctively made me cautious. I paused, 
Momentarily disoriented by the absence of the harsh glare or searing heat that direct starlight signified on my world. Instead, I was greeted by a gentle warmth and the sight of an endless green field stretching out before me, devoid of the glass sand and barren deserts that marked the sunward side of Dareshi. Using my long arms for balance, I descended the ramp carefully. Waiting at the bottom was Daniel, his face breaking into a welcoming smile as he saw me approach. Welcome to Earth, Liren, he said, gesturing toward the meadow around us. This is our first stop. We thought a peaceful green field would be the perfect introduction for visitors from tidally locked worlds. I looked around, taking in the serene landscape. I can see why you chose this place, I replied thoughtfully. It's a gentle environment. Vast fields like this are impossible in Dareshi, quite different from what I expected. Daniel nodded. We wanted you to experience the softer side of our planet first. We figured starting here might make the transition easier. Observing the other delegates, I began to appreciate the wisdom in his words. The Zalcorans were tentatively touching the grass, their limbs adjusting to the uneven terrain. The Thalaxians were gazing up at the sky, their multiple eyes reflecting the sunlight as they marveled at the clouds drifting lazily above. There was a noticeable sense of wonder as they explored. The vastness of the open space, the gentle fluctuations of the breeze, the subtle shifts in light and shadow. I glanced upward, half expecting the sun to scorch my eyes, but instead found it hanging in the sky like a benevolent guardian. The warmth on my skin was pleasant, not searing, and the air carried a cool breeze that contrasted with the warmth. It was astonishing to stand under an open sky bathed in sunlight without fear. It's remarkable, I admitted, turning back to Daniel. In my world, standing with the sun directly above you would be impossible without immediate harm. Here, the sun provides warmth and light without destruction. That's one of the benefits of a rotating planet, Daniel replied with a grin. Our rotation and atmosphere help regulate the temperatures, making most of the surface habitable. We thought you'd appreciate seeing a place where the sun isn't something to fear. I watched as the other delegates continued to explore, their initial hesitation giving way to genuine fascination. They were touching flowers, listening to the rustle of leaves, and some were even lying down on the soft grass, feeling the earth beneath them. It was clear that this environment, born from the very rotation we once found so unsettling, held a unique appeal. I must admit, I said slowly, there's a certain harmony here I did not anticipate. Where will you take us next? Daniel's eyes met mine, his expression earnest. Well, the next stop is a beach where we're going to watch the sunset. I nodded, beginning to grasp the concept. You mean the moment of transition between light and dark? Exactly, he agreed. And this is just the beginning of what Earth has to offer. We have so much more to show you at night. I felt a stirring of anticipation. I look forward to discovering more, I said sincerely. We reboarded the shuttle with newfound eagerness, the earlier hesitations giving way to anticipation. Conversations buzzed softly among the delegates as the vessel ascended, charting a course to our next destination. This time, when the ramp lowered, we descended with less caution onto a vast land of golden sand. The warmth beneath my feet was surprising, not searing like the sunward deserts of Dareshi, but pleasantly warm. The grains shifted under my weight, a sensation unfamiliar and intriguing. Around me, others were experiencing similar reactions, their initial curiosity blossoming into genuine fascination. We gathered along the shoreline, the unpredictable sound of waves gently lapping at the shore providing a soothing atmosphere. As we awaited the sunset, time seemed to stretch and blend. The sky began to transform, hues of orange and pink bleeding into one another. For a fleeting moment, I sensed a shared sentiment among us. Perhaps rotating worlds held a beauty and harmony we hadn't considered. But the tranquility was abruptly shattered when a Thalaxian delegate stumbled, its multiple legs faltering before it collapsed onto the sand, its hard shell pressing into the grains. A murmur of concern rippled through the group. A Zalcoran approached me unsteadily, its scaled skin paling. 
I don't feel so well, it whispered before emptying the contents of its stomach at my feet. Panic ensued as more delegates began showing signs of distress. The humans rushed to assist, their faces etched with confusion and concern. Amidst the chaos, I realized that whatever was happening would hinder our plans to watch the sunset. Then, without warning, a wave of nausea washed over me. The horizon tilted, and my equilibrium faltered. Easy, Liren, Daniel said suddenly at my side to support me. My limbs felt heavy, each movement requiring immense effort. With his help, I was guided back toward the shuttle, the world around me spinning in a disorienting blur. Hours passed as we sat pressed against the cool walls of the shuttle, the initial panic subsiding into a weary silence. The humans moved about with urgency, their attempts to diagnose our affliction only adding to their frustration. I could hear snippets of their conversations, terms like infection and allergic reaction being ruled out one by one. Through the haze of discomfort, I barely followed when the medical team, with input from specialists from our species who helped from space, finally reached a conclusion. It was long after the sun had set, a fact that filled me with quiet disappointment despite my condition, when they determined that we were all suffering from motion sickness. Later, Daniel stood before us, his expression full of apology and regret. We owe you all an apology, he began solemnly. We didn't anticipate that Earth's rotation would have such an effect on you. The Coriolis effect, the force caused by our planet's rotation, is something we've evolved to withstand. We dismissed its impact as negligible, not considering how it might affect those from tidally locked worlds. Unfortunately, we'll have to cancel the rest of our tour until we can find a solution. There was a murmur among the delegates, a blend of relief and lingering disappointment. I met Daniel's gaze, appreciating the genuine remorse in his eyes. No, I said softly, maybe we can resist it. He nodded slowly. We'll work hard to make sure your next visit is more comfortable. In the meantime, if there's anything we can do to assist you, please let us know. As the shuttle prepared to return to the USS Beyond Horizon, I felt a heavy reluctance settling over me. Despite the discomfort twisting my insides, a stubborn part of me resisted the idea of leaving Earth so soon. Yes, the day had been filled with unexpected chaos, but that only made the allure of this spinning world stronger. I had barely scratched the surface of what Earth had to offer. To leave now, simply because of something as trivial as motion sickness, felt like admitting defeat. Daniel's words echoed in my mind, about the Coriolis effect, about how humans had evolved to adapt to this rotating planet. But I wasn't human, and I wanted to push past that limitation. There was a part of me that longed to experience everything Earth had, even if it meant enduring this strange affliction a little longer. Perhaps with time, I could adapt too. When Daniel approached me to take me to my seat, apologetic and offering assistance, I hesitated before speaking. It's unfortunate, I said, though my voice wavered. But perhaps you could allow me to stay until the next cycle of light? I stared into his eyes and added, a few more hours of this will not kill me. The other delegates turned to stare at me, their expressions revealing utter shock and disbelief. The humans around us stopped what they were doing, their faces unreadable, as they too were questioning my sanity. I could feel the weight of their gazes, but the thought of leaving Earth so soon gnawed at me, stronger than the discomfort. Daniel, who had crouched beside me, stood and gave me a long, concerned look. Liren, you'll have another chance. We'll figure out a way to make it easier next time, maybe with some medicine or a way to ease the effects. You don't need to suffer now. His voice was gentle, urging me to reconsider. A spark of irritation flared in me. He was treating me like a child, someone who couldn't handle a bit of discomfort. Pushing myself up, I braced against the wall my long arms gripping it for balance as the world around me spun with the planet's relentless rotation. I'm already here, I insisted, my voice sharper than I intended. I want to see the change of cycles. 
I can endure a little suffering for the experience. You don't need to worry about me. Normally, I was the type to follow orders, to stay in line, but something about this place, this spinning world with its constant motion, had moved me. I didn't want the experience to end, even if it meant dealing with the nausea that had knocked the others off their feet. I wanted to stay, to see what I could endure. The other delegates erupted in protest, their voices rising in a chaotic wave as they all began speaking at once. They demanded to leave, to return to the safety of the USS Beyond Horizon immediately. Some were so vehement that they called for me to be left behind, suggesting that the humans use the shuttle to take them back to space. I swayed on my feet, my head spinning along with the planet, but I still caught snippets of their demands to use the shuttle. Idiots, I thought, frustration boiling within me. Did they truly believe the humans had only one shuttle on this entire planet? I understood their emotional response, but the way they were acting, these supposedly wise species, reduced to squabbling over a bit of motion sickness, seemed absurd. How could they become so irrational, so weak-minded in the face of something so trivial? Eventually, the humans managed to calm the commotion, agreeing to let me stay behind with Daniel while the rest of the group returned to the USS Beyond Horizon. As the shuttle lifted off, the others safely aboard, I watched them depart, my gaze filled with relief and defiance. I wondered if Daniel would be angry with me for causing such a scene, for disrupting their carefully planned return trip, but something unexpected happened. Daniel patted me on the back and smiled. I get it, Liren he said, his voice understanding. I climb mountains, and I know the frustration when the weather forces me to turn back before I reach the summit. It's maddening, but sometimes you just want to keep going, even when it's tough. I blinked at him, surprised by the comparison. He continued. I know this wasn't the plan, but there's a spot I think you'll like. Another shuttle's on its way to take us there. We'll watch the sunrise. It's far away, but I have a feeling it'll be worth it. His words resonated with me. Despite the discomfort still twisting inside me, the thought of seeing more of this world, of pushing through the sickness to experience something unique, felt right. I'd like that, I agreed, my voice quieter now but firm. We waited together, the soft vibration of the departing shuttle fading into the background. When the new shuttle finally arrived, Daniel helped me aboard. My limbs felt heavy, the world still spinning, but I gritted my teeth and powered through the dizziness. As the shuttle lifted off, I felt a surge of anticipation. I didn't know what awaited us at the next destination, but I was ready to face it, no matter how much the world around me continued to spin. I barely perceived the journey as we arrived at our new destination. The interior swayed softly, the vibration worsening the dizziness that affected me. Before I knew it, we had landed. Daniel was already at my side, his hand gently supporting my arm as he helped me to my feet. Close your eyes, he advised softly. I did as he instructed, allowing him to guide me down the ramp. My feet touched the ground, something firm yet yielding, neither the coarse sand from before nor the smooth surface of the shuttle's floors. It felt familiar resonating with memories of the rocky terrain of my homeworld. The coolness beneath my souls was comforting, grounding me in a way I hadn't felt since arriving on Earth. Daniel tapped my arm lightly. You can open your eyes now. As I lifted my eyelids, the thin membrane instinctively slid over my eyes, protecting them from any sudden glare. But there was no harsh light to shield against. Instead, a gentle breeze caressed my skin, carrying with it the crisp scent of altitude. I blinked, taking in the rugged rocks that surrounded us and the wisps of fog that drifted below. Above, the night sky stretched infinitely, a vast dome of stars more vivid than I'd ever seen. We were atop a mountain, its peak cloaked in darkness but illuminated by the shimmering celestial display overhead. The sheer scale of the view stole my breath, it was as if I stood on the very edge of the universe, something only possible because the sun was hidden, distant from the horizon. Daniel chuckled softly at my reaction. Reminds you of the strip of life in your world, doesn't it? He said. 
I didn't reply immediately, too absorbed in the sight before me. But he was right. There were some resemblances. On Dareshi, the narrow band between eternal light and perpetual darkness was where life thrived, a cavernous region carved into the mountains, forever caught in twilight. To one side, the mountains basked in unending sunlight. To the other, they were shrouded in shadow. But this was the first time I'd stood upon a mountain enveloped solely by night, the stars unmasked by any atmospheric haze. Daniel excused himself briefly, disappearing back into the shuttle. He returned moments later carrying a thick garment, its material unfamiliar, but appearing dense and warm. He offered it to me. You'll need this, he said with a small smile. I accepted it, the fabric heavy in my hands. Mimicking his earlier actions, I managed to wrap it around myself, its weight settling comfortably on my shoulders. Daniel gestured for me to follow him. We navigated a short path to a flat rock that jutted out over the landscape. He took a seat and patted the spot beside him. As I settled down, he pointed toward the horizon. That's where the sun will rise, he told me. I gazed in the direction he indicated. The horizon was still cloaked in darkness, with no hint of the sun's approach. The familiarity of the environment, the solid rock beneath me, the crisp air, made me feel at ease. This place, it makes me feel better, I admitted. The nausea had subsided to a manageable whisper, overshadowed by the serenity of our surroundings. Daniel glanced at me, a gentle curiosity in his eyes. I'm glad, he said. Earth has so many different environments, I thought you might appreciate this one. We fell into conversation, comparing our worlds. I spoke of the cavernous habitats of Dereshi, the way our species had adapted to the narrow strip where life could exist. He described Earth's diverse climates, the way the planet's rotation and tilt created seasons and cycles that influenced every aspect of life. Time seemed to blur as we shared stories, his tales of scaling mountains, pushing against the limits of gravity, and mine of navigating the treacherous crevices of my home, where a single misstep could mean a plunge into darkness or light. As we talked, the horizon began to transform. Subtle hues of indigo and violet gave way to shades of pink and orange, the sky painting itself in a gradient of colors. The stars slowly faded, retreating as the dawn approached. Our conversation dwindled, both of us drawn into the spectacle unfolding before us. Then, with a quiet grandeur, the sun's first rays breached the horizon. A sliver of golden light emerged, casting a gentle glow over the mountaintop. The warmth touched my skin delicately, a soft embrace rather than the searing intensity I'd always associated with starlight. I felt a swell of emotion rise within me, wonder or an almost childlike joy. I realized I'd forgotten entirely about my discomfort, the motion sickness, the dizziness. All of it had faded into the background, insignificant in the face of this moment. My eyes drank in the sight, the membrane retracting slightly as I adjusted to the increasing light. Something shifted within me. Watching the sunrise, I understood that there was more to this spinning world than chaos and instability. There was a rhythm here, a balance within the constant change. The sun's ascent was not a harsh transition, but a gentle progression, bringing light and warmth without erasing the beauty of the night that came before. The warmth spread through me, not just from the sun's rays, but from a newfound appreciation. The rotation that once seemed so unsettling now revealed itself as a source of endless variation and life. I turned to Daniel, who was watching me with a knowing smile. Thank you, I whispered, my voice barely carrying over the soft breeze. He nodded, understanding without the need for further words. At that moment, I felt a connection, not just to Daniel, but to this world. The boundaries between familiar and foreign blurred, and I embraced the realization that change could be harmonious, and that movement could bring stability of a different kind. The spinning of Earth no longer felt like an affront to reason, but an invitation to see the universe in a new way. 
and I was ready to accept it. Hours later, as the soft glow of dawn began to fade into morning light, it was time for me to leave. Daniel and I stood at the edge of the mountain peak, the crisp air carrying the scent of earth and distant foliage. He had a relaxed smile on his face, but I could see the exhaustion behind his eyes, the result of staying up all night to share this experience with me. I hesitated for a moment, reluctant to break the quiet camaraderie that had formed between us. Looks like your ride's here, Daniel said, nodding toward another shuttle as it descended smoothly onto the rocky plateau. The ship's engines whirred softly, preparing for its return to the USS Beyond Horizon. I quietly thanked Daniel, feeling as though my words couldn't fully capture the depth of my gratitude. He simply smiled, his expression full of understanding and warmth, a reassurance that no further explanation was needed. I turned and walked toward the shuttle, each step feeling heavier than the rest, not from fatigue, but from the weight of the experience. As I reached the ramp, I paused and glanced back. Daniel was still standing there, hands in his jacket pockets, watching me with that easy smile. The closure of the door felt like the end of a friendship, a short one like the cycles of light and darkness on his world. The journey to the USS Beyond Horizon was a blur. The lingering dizziness from the Earth's rotation was still present, but felt more like a gentle sway than the overwhelming nausea from before. My thoughts were filled with the images of the sunrise, the warmth of the sun's first light, and the profound conversations with Daniel. Upon docking, I stepped into the common area, immediately sensing a shift in the atmosphere. Conversations halted mid-sentence, and dozens of eyes turned towards me. The delegates who had returned early due to motion sickness regarded me with a mixture of disbelief and subtle disdain. A Zalcoran near the entrance clicked its mandibles, a sign of disapproval in their culture. So, you chose to stay on that volatile planet, it said, its reflective skin shimmering under the artificial lighting. A Thalaxian, with its hard-layered shell, softly added, Why subject yourself to such discomfort? The motion sickness alone was unbearable. Whispers spread through the room. Does he enjoy suffering? One murmured. Perhaps the rotation affected his judgment, another replied. I could feel the weight of their gazes, their inability to comprehend my actions. My head still spun slightly, but it was a small price to pay for what I had experienced. I could explain. I moved past them and continued walking toward my private area. But I don't think any of you will understand. 